It's great to welcome to the program today Dacker Keltner, who's a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley, the faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center, and also author of the book The Power Paradox, which we're linking to. Uh, it's great to have you on today. David, it's great to be with you. So I, I feel like this conversation is just so relevant in terms yeah. of even just thinking about American politics right now and the types of leaders that have have done well and not so well over the past many years. Maybe just to start with, my understanding of the sort of Machiavellian view of power is that at a very crude top level, it's better to be feared than loved in terms of maintaining influence and and maintaining that power. What are the flaws with that approach uh, generally and maybe in particular today? Yeah, you know, the Machiavellian approach of power, you nicely summarized, David, it, you know, let's remember it emerged in the early 1500s, uh, probably in one of the most violent times in human history. Uh, and Machiavelli wrote this book, The Prince, uh, and some people question whether he was really being sincere. But the idea of power there is that you lie, you deceive, you pretend that you're religious when you're not, and you kill your enemies and you destabilize your allies, right? So power is about fear and uh, and uh, acquisition, sort of unilateral acquisition. And we, we've really changed dramatically as a human society in those 500 years, as everybody knows, right? Um, with works more complicated, politics are more complicated. Uh, we've seen the rise of rights uh, of different kinds. And so it's, it's, it's just a different world. And when you look at empirical tests, of the Machiavellian perspective. Do you believe that you should lie and manipulate and hurt others to rise in power? What you find is those people don't do as well in organizations today. Uh, they don't do as well in American politics. You know, the, the classic Machiavellian was uh, President Nixon, uh, who's now rated as one of the least effective presidents uh, by historians. Um, and we've even done studies showing they don't do as well in finance <laughs> in one of the more Machiavellian contexts. So, you know, what I argue in the power paradox is it might be time to abandon that philosophy of power. It's been wildly influential. I think it's I think it's at the source of a lot of today's environmental and social ills. What do you think or what do you make of the often repeated idea that the more unchecked and or unilateral power one has, the more likely they will be pushed into bad acts or or corruption or whatever the case may be. Is it that simple? I, I think it's 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 a broad hypothesis that you just articulated with many versions. Right. Mm. Uh, the idea of a democracy is you, you keep power in check uh, and when it's not kept in check, as you suggest, David, things get into trouble. The idea of journalism is that you you speak truth to power. You hold the powerful accountable. When President Trump tries to destabilize the idea of facts and journalism, uh, we have the trouble we have today, right? Where people question the very notion of a shared democracy. So, yeah, it's it's fundamental. And you know what's really interesting, David? When I did the research for the power paradox. This is actually a very old idea in the evolution of hu our human species. Right. Hunter gatherer societies, hundreds of thousands of years old, uh, very sophisticated analyses show, did this. They kept the powerful in check through social processes, through reputation, through various things that gave rise to our, our critical oversight of the powerful. And, and I really worry, as you probably do too, that, you know, that when we lose those capacities to keep the powerful in check, you get into serious trouble is um, is, is the sort of Machiavellian approach to power and governance um, in the modern day essentially equivalent to authoritarianism in the sense that, you know, when I think of, of now about being feared, I think yeah. about Duterte, I think about Kim Jong Un, I think about Putin, I think about Assad. I sort yeah. of think about Trump in that I think he would like to be that, although yeah. maybe because of his cartoonish nature, he failed to actually do it in, in practice. But he liked he a lot of those authoritarians as well. Is that analogous? It is. And, and it, it very much, you know, this Machiavellian view of dominate, coerce, lie, manipulate, scare very much 
uh, finds a home in authoritarian politics. And in fact, some of the most authoritarian politicians in human history, uh, like Mussolini, were huge fans of Machiavelli, right? And kept the, kept the prince as a, a leadership guide. And, and I agree, I think that Trump, you know, wanted to be that, but was kept in check by Wall Street and corporations and the like. And uh, so uh, thank goodness in some sense. So it does, Machiavellianism, Machiavellianism is very closely allied with authoritarianism. Uh, even in the American citizenry, we, do, we just published a paper showing kind of, um, it's interesting, you know, white, men who have been disenfranchised in the United States tend to want that kind of political philosophy to lead. Hmm. So it's it's a lot. And, and do they want it because they feel that it will, as they see it, re-enfranchise them? Exactly. Oh. You know, hmm. and I know. And so it's this interesting uh, quality of American politics that, that that we have to grapple with. That's pretty self-evident. I'm this is maybe getting more into sort of the psychology of power in some yeah. sense, but I'm curious what, what you think of it. There is this um, I don't know if it's like a survivorship bias sort of thing or I, I don't know exactly what I would call it, but there's definitely this idea. And this happens, I think, in the business world. This happens in the political world and elsewhere where once you achieve a certain amount of power, success, influence, whatever, over time you become accustomed to it and you sort of start to think that like it it had to be this way. It was yeah. it's this way because I deserve it or it's this yeah. way because I'm better or whatever the case may be. And it's it's very hard to fight that even yeah. sometimes when I like will will mentor smaller YouTubers or something like that. Yeah. Um, I because I've been doing this for so long, I'll sort of think like, well, you know, the I just did some really basic stuff and it just sort of like happened and it would have happened regardless. But it, it, it really actually it, it's the work and it's the day to day, et cetera. There's nothing inevitable about a lot of this stuff. No. How does that psychological aspect play into how this evolves? You know, I, I think that's it's such an astute observation. And, and, you know, I think one of the most pernicious dimensions to American politics um, it is this dynamic you're referring to. Uh, we've studied it in the form of essentialism, right? Mm. Which is what you find in corporations and you find in uh, organizational structures is this idea of people who have power start to become blind to the breaks they got, the sources, the opportunities that came their way by where they were born or um, the, just by fate, mm -hmm. uh, and they start to develop a sense that it takes special people to lead. Right. Uh, and, and it is this sense of like, wow, I, I have power, power there, there must be, we justify it and we think, wow, I'm some sort of uniquely gifted person to rise to the top. And why is that perilous? Because number one, it leads to, and we've done work on this, um, certain kinds of ideas about compensation. Well, maybe mm. I deserve $20 million a year for the work I do, right? It's like a veil of meritocracy in a sense. It is very much so, very much so. Uh, and, and the idea of meritocracy, right? That it's really the special people that, you know, that get into the special schools or deserve certain kinds of compensation or, or get treated by the law differently, <laughs> which we have ample evidence of. So I think it's a really dangerous corollary of, of the psychological dynamics of power that the powerful think they're above the law and, and deserve more than other people. There's these studies that have been popularized over the last few years about how being wealthy, particularly for a long period of time, starts to change the brain in some way. And like what yeah. exactly that means we can talk about it. And it's kind yeah. of like the, the devil is in the details. But does being in a p position of power in the way that you study also have a, a, a similar effect? Yeah, you, you, you know, and this is work by Supvinder Obi in Canada and uh, Naomi Eisenberger at UCLA. I mean, it's astonishing that you can give somebody, you can place somebody randomly into a position of power, right? I could take you and randomly assign you to like, hey, you're in charge of other people and, and you're the powerful one. And, and one of the big effects at the neurophysiological level is that it, it tends to uh, deactivate the empathy regions of your brain. Mm. <laughs> so I've got that, to do some tough stuff. I might not have done this before, but now that I'm in this position, it's just what I have to do. Right. 
but but what I worry about with the the deactivation of these empathy regions, and we've also found power deactivates the vagus nerve, which is a big bundle of nerves in your chest mm. that helps you connect and be kind to other people. So suddenly when powerful people are acting in more greedy fashion, they're not sensitive to suffering, they're not aware of other people to the extent that they used to be, we now have a neurophysiological understanding of that, that power, you know, one person put it dramatically, like it shuts down your empathy regions. That's a little dramatic, but it, it's on the way towards what's true of power. So the paradox, or at least what one one of the paradoxes that you talk about is yeah. individuals or groups or whoever they get power. Yeah. And the idea is that they're being empowered in order to do things for a group of people. But exactly. the more power they get for a lot of the different reasons you've talked about starts to limit their ability to really fully think about how they can keep the interests of, of everyone uh, sort of in mind in their actions. Right. I mean, like this is sort of the paradox that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, and, and you just nailed. 25 years of my life studying power in different <laughs> ways, right? You know? But thank you, you know. Yeah, you know, what, surprise, what may surprise people is, but once you start thinking deeply about it, there's a lot of truth to this. And, and we've looked at, like, who gains power in hunter-gatherer societies, mm -hmm. sports teams, nonprofits, government, even finance, et cetera. And it's people, like you said, David, who, and Hannah Arendt really put it well, as did Michel Foucault, um, who... You gain power by advancing the greater good, by advancing the interests of the people around you. That is just a basic law, right? And so you do it through promoting strong social networks and, and sharing knowledge and distributing resources. That leads you to rise in the ranks. And then regrettably, through these psychological processes we've been talking about, once I feel powerful and I'm seduced by myself, <laughs> you know, I start you know, acting unethically and failing to attend to people's thoughts or recommendations and not feeling for other people. So that's the paradox of power is, is we rise in some sense to advance other people's interests. But when we feel powerful, we work against it. Have the stakes sort of changed in the sense that, for example, like in Jared Diamond's work, he's written a lot about how the ability to cooperate and the ability to advance the greater good for your, you know, maybe clan of 150 people yeah. at that point, not being the team player, et cetera, you could be out and you could be dead. Right. Like yeah. the stakes were yeah. were were very, very uh, light life or death. Yeah. Maybe in some senses in 2021 that applies, but it feels yeah. as though maybe the stakes have changed to a degree. Yeah, I think that's the big question, right? which is, and you, you put it really, and this is Christopher Baum who really wrote about hierarchies and that Jared Diamond's commenting upon, which is that you had to cooperate and be interdependent and work collectively to survive for right. a couple hundred thousand years. And today, in some sense, um, you, a lot of the basic processes that enabled that cooperation have been degraded, right? Mm. So our ability to hold leaders accountable you know, in the, the financial collapse of 2008, I don't think anyone, I think one person was prosecuted, right? So that just means you can go do whatever you want to do yeah. uh, if you're white and privileged and, and, and not be held accountable. That's problematic to this model, this cooperative model of power. I worry about uh, certain contexts that teach this Machiavellian you know, self-interested above others model of, of how to lead you know, you see that in important institutions like, you know, certain business schools and certain views of economic views of human nature. So. So, yeah, you know, I think you're you're framing it real. I wish I'd frame that in that fashion in the power paradox, which is we had this workable model of power, right, for hundreds of thousands of years. And now it's been degraded and we see levels of greed and environmental destruction even um, that come out of this model of power that we that may cause our demise. The book is called The Power Paradox. We've been speaking with the book's author, Dacher Keltner, professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. So great having you on. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for your thoughtful questions, David.